Man, how did you come up with the five questions? Um, so, you know, these are, it's, it's a little bit hard to describe, honestly, because um, they are questions that, in some respects, I've been asking all my life. Mm. Um, and so um, it's, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to pinpoint. I mean, in the, in the context of writing the speech, um, the speech itself was really about a simple point, which is that we spend far too much time worrying about having the right answer and not nearly enough time thinking about the right questions to ask. And um, I really love to run, and um, I was on a run one day, and I thought, well, I need to bring this speech closer to the ground. And I thought, wow. well, I should give some examples of what I think are good questions. And I just started thinking about the kinds of questions that I ask across a lot of different contexts both in my personal life and in my professional life. And it honestly didn't take me that long to come up with the list. And I think it's in part because there are questions I really do ask. I mean, I showed the list to my wife, Katie, hmm. and um, she took one look at it. She said, you ask these questions like every day. <laughs> As in, you're annoying. <laughs> right. <laughs> I understand all too well. <laughs> now, um, go, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, but have you always liked asking questions? Because it seems like you always have. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, I tell this story in the book, and it's absolutely true that I asked a ton of questions when I was a kid. And it wasn't just the, you know, the sort of why is the sky blue kind of questions, but, um, you know, I would interrogate my parents at the dinner table over issues large and small um, to the point where, you know, my father would say things like, you know, life is not a great debate, or <laughs> it's not always important to be right, or you really had better be a lawyer because I can't imagine you making a living any other way. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I I then continued uh, down this path. I was on the debate team in high school, and I, it, I was like in heaven because there was a portion in the kind of debate I did where you got to cross-examine the other <laughs> The other side, and I I just loved it. I just felt like this is what I was meant to do. And so I ultimately um, went to law school and became a law professor. And a huge part of that is because I really do love asking questions, and I really do think it's both a both a skill and an art to mm. ask just the right question. And it's something that's it's just something that's fascinated me um, for a very long time. I mean, I make the analogy in the book to um, questions being like keys. And that if you have the right question, you can unlock something that you didn't already know. And I really do think of them that way. And so thinking about the right question is like trying to find the right key. Wow. Now, you work at Harvard. <laughs> um, you work I do. With, you work with, with students all the time. Why do you think teenagers in particular get to a certain point in time in life where they go, man, okay, I'm just, they stop asking questions, Jim. They literally, you know, ask questions all throughout, you know, childhood. Yeah. Then they get to middle yeah. school and they go, okay, no more questions. What, yeah. what can teachers and youth pastors do to help teenagers ask the right questions? I think, I think the way that they can most help is by asking questions themselves mm. and by modeling for, um, for students or um, teenagers in whatever context they're working in um, that it is perfectly appropriate to ask questions. And some of this is um, uh, teachers or pastors showing their own vulnerability insofar as they admit that they don't have all the answers mm -hmm. um, and that it's okay to ask questions when you don't have the answers. And it's okay to remain curious about things. I think part of what happens um, in the teenage years is that it becomes uncool to be curious and it becomes mm. uncool to um, not have answers. Um, and that carries over into adult life. I mean, you just think about how people act in an office setting um, or even in a classroom, right, where you find a lot of people are afraid to ask a question because they're afraid that they're going to appear dumb. Like mm. they feel like yeah. they should already know the answer, right? And so there becomes a stigma attached to just asking basic questions, which is why the first question in my book is, wait, what, right? Which is yeah. basically saying, I don't quite get it yet, and can you slow down and explain again? 
I'm 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 always um, uh, I, I'm always surprised by the reticence of students um, to ask those basic questions, and I always tell them that look. If you don't understand what I'm saying, you absolutely should ask me to explain it again because if you don't understand it, I guarantee you that there are plenty of other students in the class who also don't understand it. So someone has to have the courage to say, hey, wait, I don't get this. Yeah. Um, and that's and that always happens, right? You see it anytime you're with a group of <laughs> yes. people. You get that one brave soul who says, you know what, I, I don't quite get it. And then you, you look around the room and you're just like, <laughs> yeah, me neither. Head nodding like, yeah, I don't get it either. Thank you. <laughs> oh, me neither. Now, out of the five questions, I'll put you on the spot here, Jim. Out of the five questions, there's really six, the bonus question too, but out of the, out of the five, um, which one do you like the best when it comes to the five questions? I'll, I'll tell you for me, Jim, number four is the best one for me. How can I help? How, um, how can I help? I, I, I love that one. But out of the yeah. five, which is your favorite question to ask, man? <laughs> I honestly don't have a favorite, and a lot of it depends on the context, okay. to, be, to be totally honest. Um, I am, like you, um, a big fan of how of asking how can I help? Um, because I do think that that's the right way to right way to approach helping someone. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a way of approaching with humility and respect, and it's also a way of approaching someone with the understanding that you're likely to be helped as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also I also really love because I ask this question all the time, and I think it's really useful. I love the question, um, couldn't we at least? And I think that it's a really important question to ask these days when our world seems so polarized and divided yeah. that we focus so much on what divides us and don't spend enough time thinking about what unites us. And the question, couldn't we at least agree, is really a way to remind yourself and, and to actually ask the question um, in a way that shows that you're interested in finding some consensus, right? It's mm. not a question that is necessarily going to cancel out um, all disagreements, but it's likely to put you on a, on a more solid footing and a more positive footing, where you can then, once you recognize that, yeah, you do have various agreements, you can then focus on, on where you do disagree. And what I find oftentimes is that a lot of, a lot of debates and differences um, are really about means rather than ends. Uh, and if you stopped and asked, well, couldn't we at least agree um, that we share similar goals? Right? That's not right. really simple, but it can be a profound way to yeah. get people who disagree about something to recognize that they're actually after the same goals. They just have a very different way of approaching it. But if you frame it that way, if you say, you know what, look, I agree that you are just as interested in helping kids as I am. Hmm. Now let's talk about why... I think you should help them in this way, and you think you should help them in another way. And let's talk about like what way is likely to be more effective, and what way is likely to allow um, allow us to achieve the goals that we both share. Yeah, that's a good word, Jim. I have to ask you this because you talk about it in the book, and there are very—I mean, you're, you're you're very vulnerable to be honest with you in in the book. But there are two vulnerable points here. One is when you changed careers. Um, how mm-hmm. did you decide to ask the question, hey, I need to go from being a lawyer to working in education, and how did all that come about? Yeah. Um, well, you know, in some respects, um, I, asked, I asked the question of what truly matters. Mm. Um, and the issue of education is one that I have been interested in um, for a very long time, both from an academic perspective, but also from a personal one. Mm. Um, from the academic side, you know, as a law professor, I wrote and taught about law and education um, and the different ways that law structures educational opportunity. And so I wrote about school desegregation and school finance and school choice and the like. But an interest is also personal because of my own experience. You know, I grew up, as you know from the book, um, in a blue-collar suburb in New Jersey. Yeah. Neither of my parents went to college, but both of them cared deeply about education. I had some teachers who cared a lot about me. 
um, and helped me get into Yale, which um, I never expected to go to. And it, and it honestly opened up doors that I didn't even know existed. But it got me thinking as early as college about why the system works for me when it doesn't work for so many others, right? I mean, wow. the public education system worked exactly the way we hope it will, as yeah. far as I was concerned. Um, but it fails so many others. And that mm. question has been... Um, driving me my entire professional life. And when the opportunity to be the dean of the ed school came up, I mean, it really was an out-of-the-blue kind of opportunity. And it was a hard decision, in part because I loved being a law professor and I loved living in Charlottesville. And we had four school-age kids at the time. But I thought, you know, this is a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to actually make a difference in education. Wow. Um, not that you can't make a difference as a law professor, but, right. um, this, this was a, you know, this is, this was an, e- this is an even better opportunity to, um, to try to improve education and an opportunity to work with people whose life mission is the same as mine, which is try to expand educational opportunities and improve outcomes. Um, so it was a hard, in some respects, it was a hard call because the logistics were difficult. Um, but in other ways, you know, once I started thinking about what truly matters and what I really cared about, um, uh, it became easy. And it was also easier in, in that um, my wife's parents live just outside of Boston. Right. So this is a way <laughs> for our family to be closer together. Now, I ask this question with all respect. I'm a, I'm a big fan of our, our public school system. But yeah. why do you think the public school system in America right now, um, in most parts of the country, why do you think it's not working right no, that's a very big question. Yeah. Um, and um, I think that um, I think that in reality, um, it is actually working quite well for some students and not well for others. Yeah. Um, in that, um, in that we don't really have one public education system. We have at least fifty-one if you count the fifty states in D.C. But right. more like fourteen thousand when you think about the number of school districts. Wow. And what you see when you look at it that way is that you've got some incredibly great schools and some incredibly great school systems and some really failing ones. And the big problem with the ones that are failing um, is that, you know, you have a combination of um, kids who come from difficult circumstances, um, who face a lot of challenges, who because of residential segregation tend to be segregated in their schools. And so you have these schools where you have enormous challenges and um, and the system is not set up to mm-hmm. enable success um, in terms of the resources that are available, in terms of governance, in terms of who is, um, uh, um, who is attracted to um, uh, work in those systems. Um, and you know, the, the reality is that um, we just haven't done enough to recognize that um, kids who need more assistance deserve more assistance. Wow. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I think at the end of the day, that's the, you know, that's, that, that's one of the biggest problems. Yeah, I, I couldn't say it better. <laughs> I, like, amen, 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 as we say in the black church, Jim. Um, <laughs> Jim you know, a question here. Do you think there is a role for church and education to partner together? Um, and should they be working more together or not, Jim? Is that a fair question? I totally, I, I totally think that there, um, there should be more connection. Um, and, um, in fact, um, we just hired a faculty member, Irvin Scott, um, who uh, has a, has uh, a long um, track record in education, including um, as a teacher, as a principal, assistant superintendent, and then he worked for three years or maybe five years at the Gates Foundation. Wow. But he's become really interested in this topic of how do you bring in more religious leaders into the conversation about um, education. Really? And wow. Yeah, and I and I think he's he's really on to something because, you know, um, it is really a community wide effort to improve education, um, and you need families involved, but you also need communities involved, 
And in a lot of communities, um, religious leaders are very influential. Um, and schools have not done enough, I think, um, to reach out to those leaders and pull them into the conversation about how do we support, um, how do we support our school? Huh. I would like to talk to him, by the way, because I, I would agree. And I think it's on both sides, to be honest with you, Jim. I don't, I don't know if churches have done a great job either. And I think mm-hmm. part of it is when we think of church and state separation, which, yeah. I mean, I definitely stand by that too as well. I think there becomes this, okay, well, I don't want to cross over to their yard <laughs> per se. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah. and they're probably saying, I don't want to cross over to their yard either. And there is yeah. this, there's this misunderstanding but I also think there's a lot of things that are just common in both yards. I totally agree. To be fair. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. And I, and I think that there's much more room for collaboration under the law than people imagine, right? So yeah. the, the idea of separation of church and state is one that has really taken a hold in the public imagination. And it is, in some respect, the bedrock principle of constitutional law, but it doesn't mean that there can be no collaboration whatsoever and no cooperation, yeah. right? I mean, there's some fairly technical rules about where you um, can't cross the line, um, but it doesn't mean that you can ever sit down in a room together and yeah. have a conversation and think about all the various ways that you can work together. No, I definitely get it. A couple more questions here, because I, I mean, once again, you were vulnerable. Another vulnerable point here is you talked about meeting your biological mom um, yeah. in this book. And we kind of had the same story here on this one. Mine was my biological dad, in fact. Um, I, was, I was adopted. Um, he lived down the street from us. Never knew it until I was no in the, kidding. No kidding. And, until I was in the 12th grade. And so oh my gosh. it was one of those things when I read this in your book, I said, get out of here. <laughs> so, so it's kind of one, it's a personal question, but question for the audience as well. How did you embrace that per se? And how did you ask the right questions on how to deal with that with your mom, biological mom? Sorry. Um, so it was really um, one step at a time, to be honest. Mm. Um, and it wasn't something where, um, I had a game plan worked out. Um, you know, it began with um, just curiosity uh, about um, whether I could find out any information about my biological parents. Um, and then once I found out that I could, I wrote and um, got the basic non identifying information. So, you know, I learned first names but not last names. Mm-hmm. Um, but the story was so compelling and not what I thought it was going to be. Um, gotcha. you know, I never, I never imagined that, um, I honestly never imagined that, um, my biological mother would have been older, um, huh. when she had me, that she would have been so distraught about, um, giving me up for adoption, yeah. that she would come from Ireland, um, and, uh, and that she would ultimately decide to give me up for adoption because she thought, I needed a, a mother and a father. Um, and it was a heartbreaking document to read. Um, I had never intended to actually try to find her, but hmm. after I read the document, and especially after I handed it to my wife, Katie, who read it, and with tears in her eyes when she <laughs> got to the end, she said, you need to find her. You need to find her and let her know that everything turned out okay. Um, and it was at that point that I decided, yeah, I, I, that's absolutely what I needed to do. Um, and so I ultimately did find her. Um, but even then, I, I, I really, my only plan was to talk to her and say, <laughs> everything turned out okay. I'm happy. I've got a great family. Um, I'm happy in my work. I have a lot of friends. Um, and thank you and then, for literally giving me life. Um, but from the moment I talked to her, I knew that it was going to be more because mm-hmm. I realized, um, although I had never really thought about her, to be honest, very much, I realized that she had thought about me every day of my life and that had never stopped thinking about me as her son. Um, and then I met her and, you know, she's impossible not to fall in love with. I mean, wow. she's, she's just a remarkable woman. And, um, and it just, 
it, just sort of one step at a time, um, we got to know each other better. I met um, her other four kids, and they're equally wonderful and mm. welcoming. And um, we've just developed a relationship over time. But wow. I can't say it was part of a part of a, a part of a grand plan. But it did start by asking, "I wonder why I was adopted, and I wonder if I could find my biological mother." Wow, it was it was really deep for me to read. I, I mean, I I was engrossed. I actually woke my wife up, and said, "You've got to read this," as she's like in bed, almost sleep. <laughs> I said, "This part's pretty good." Um, last question here: Do You really do believe that when students and people ask the right questions, they do better in life? Is that am I just am I imagining that, Jim, or do you like bank on that? You really so, believe that? I do believe that. Um, in part for the um, reason you gave at the very outset, which is that I think that asking these questions is a way to um, form connections with other people and to deepen connections that you already have. Hmm. Um, and I think that that is the key to living a happy and successful life. And I don't mean materially successful, right. but a yeah. fulfilling life. Yeah. Um, I honestly believe that. Um, these aren't the only questions that you can ask that will help you form or deepen connection, but I think that they're critical yeah. um, in that in that task. And 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 for that reason, I mean, I know it sounds like a, a slightly grandiose claim, but in in that way, I really do think that asking these questions will lead to a happier and more successful life because it will lead to more connection with other people mm. and deepen the connections that you have. That's why. I mean, that's why the last chapter is about the bonus question, and it's about the life of my friend Doug Kendall, um, who was genuinely beloved. Um, and although he obviously died at far too young an age, um, he had an incredibly successful life, and it was one that was fueled by asking great questions. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the whole book was just riveting. I mean, it was kind of one of those things, like I said earlier, I just could not put it down um, because it really got me thinking. And, and I wouldn't say these are the only questions to ask, but I would say it's a good start, Jim, <laughs> to start with these. Um, yeah. It, it, so I just cannot thank you enough on this one. Um, it's a great project. Um, I hope it does well. I pray it does well, Jim, to be honest, because I, I do think if we will learn to start to ask the right questions in our country and our culture, I do think we'll be better off, man. I, I really do. Um, I, I'm really happy to hear that. I, mean, I, I, really, I obviously really agree. And so Thanks. thank you so much, Jim. I know you're busy Yeah, today, no, it's my pleasure. But I have yeah, enjoyed this. Yeah, no, it's this. totally my pleasure. Thank I you. I have too, yeah. I appreciate your interest in the book, and it was really a pleasure to talk to you. No, thank you so much, man. Have a great day, Jim. You too. All, All right. right. Take Bye. care.